Today we're talking about a G.I. Joe infantry and finance specialist along with his animal partner. Today is all about Spearhead and Max. Let's talk about them. First, thanks for watching JLS Comics. Hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with all of our weekly content. And with that out of the way, let's jump right into our story. Walter Halgren was born in St. Louis, Missouri. Wait, what? Let's back up. When Larry Hama was building out Spearhead's file card, his name was originally Walter Hulgren, and his working code names included things like First Wave and Frontline. But then, when Hasbro got the files, they wanted to give tribute to one of their toy designers, as they've done with others as well, and so Spearhead's name was changed from Walter Hulgren to Peter R. Millman. So let's start again. Peter Millman was born in St. Louis, Missouri. And Peter grew up in the area and eventually moved out to the Pacific Northwest region of the United States, where he got a job selling life insurance. In that position, he became the most successful salesman in the entire region. As his file card notes, Peter was so good that he could sell a term life policy to a dead cow. He was likable and trustworthy, and this resulted in people buying his policies with way more coverage than they realistically needed, and truthfully, more than they could afford. But Peter was an honorable person. Perhaps because he felt guilty about influencing people like that, it drove him to enlist in the United States Army, perhaps the 3rd Armored Division given his nickname. Peter does deny that, however, and says that he just felt like someone had to do it. This determination to put the team and the mission before his own personal success made him a natural for the G.I. Joe team. And it was also during this time that Peter, now using the codename Spearhead, trained a feral bobcat to be his partner and battle buddy. And now tamed and trained, this bobcat was named Max. And Spearhead took Max to his new assignment with Special Counter-Terrorist Unit Delta, G.I. Joe. And with the G.I. Joe team, Spearhead and Max always took point on combat patrols, wanting to protect his teammates at all costs. One of his file cards notes, You can always count on this duo leading the unit to give an added punch through the enemy's defensive lines. Spearhead and Max were the tip of the combat patrol spear, hence Spearhead, providing alert, direction, description, range, assignment, and control data to the rest of the team as they pushed forward through enemy territory and ultimately made contact. This allowed everyone else in the patrol behind Spearhead and Max to know where the enemy was, the threat present, and where to start shooting. Though never depicted, Spearhead would have also had training from an engineer on how to use combat metal detectors, as well as equipment to detect IEDs, mines, traps, and explosives that might potentially be in the way. It's a high-risk, dangerous, and yet indispensable part of the patrol, and something that you probably wouldn't want to wear bright orange for, lest you find yourself in the crosshairs of an enemy sniper scope. But hey, Spearhead probably took out one of his own insurance policies on himself. About Spearhead, Lieutenant Falcon noted, quote, When some guys try to lead a combat assault, they jump and holler, Follow me! and charge full tilt at a bunker. Halfway there, they look back and no one's behind them. Of course not. That guy's a jerk. Spearhead could jump face first into a vat of rapid hyenas and 15 guys would follow him. No hesitation. they jump smiling. And of course, that feral feline he trained would always be a source of inspiration, end quote. Spearhead is one of the few characters during the Marvel Comics era of G.I. Joe, a real American hero, to not first appear in the main title. Spearhead and Max first appeared in G.I. Joe's Special Missions with 1989's issue 21. In that issue, Tunnel Rat was leading a team in the sewer tunnels beneath the federal building of the Financial District of New York City. This team was Tunnel Rat, Spearhead, Max, Charbroil, and Airtight. They were there to investigate a series of abandoned gas canisters in the tunnel that bore the sigil of Cobra. As Point Man Max's superior olfactory senses picked up on a scent and alerted Spearhead, who relayed that to the rest of the team. Then Tunnel Rat peered around one of the corners in the tunnel and saw a handful of Cobra Vipers, along with Dreadnoughts, Xandar, and Buzzer, welding. And then he called for Spearhead's firepower up front. And so with Max perched atop his rock, Spearhead and Tunnel Rat laid into the Vipers on full auto. Cobra threw some gas canisters at the Joes, and Airtight tested the air with an M265 chemical agent detector pack, but then Spearhead said that they could have just seen what Max the Bobcat was doing to know that the air was breathable. So Cobra retreated, and the Joes discovered that they were welding a tank of Type G nerve toxin to the pipes, which Airtight said was quote-unquote lethal to the Max. And now on top of Max's helmet, he growled hearing his name, and so Spearhead said to Airtight to watch his choice of expressions. They then followed the firing wire to an abandoned private subway station of John Jack Boardwalk. Well, not quite abandoned. It was occupied by a group of homeless men led by a World War II and Korean War vet who complained about how the government had abandoned him. Spearhead callously said to him, You got your medal in your parade. What did you expect? Undying gratitude? Grow up! But then Tunnel Rat was able to reason with him to point them in the right direction of the fleeing Cobras who just passed through before Spearhead and the Joes got to the subway station themselves. Sarge led the team through waist-deep water, past an albino alligator, past vent fans for the auto tunnels, to the stations where Cobra was working on a big rig milk truck. 
Cobra had the Joes boxed in, so Spearhead and Max pleaded with Sarge to get them out of there. Sarge led them up a ladder to a drainage sluice and into a catch basin that led right to the sub-basement of the World Trade Center. But then Xander ordered gas deployed in the tunnel at the same time that Buzzard tossed grenades at the Joes, and Cobra filled up the sluice tunnel with suppressive fire, so Spearhead and the Joes were trapped. Sarge dove in one of Buzzard's grenades to save the Joes, but it turned out to be a dud, so Spearhead told Sarge that it was okay and he could get up. While Max licked his face, but it was too late, Sarge was dead anyway, and so Spearhead reported this to Tunnel Rap. Sarge must have had a coronary or a stroke, Spearhead said, and at the end, ultimately the Joes made it out. And later, Zorana revealed that the gas was just a feint, a ploy to keep the phone companies out of the tunnels so that they could tap the phone lines and install a Cobra switchboard and begin their phone scams. And then Spearhead and Max also made it onto the painted Dave Dorman cover-up, Spring 1988's G.I. Joe magazine. From the vehicle that Spearhead was driving, Storm Shadow, Captain Morgan himself on the hood as he aimed his bow and arrow at a rather defiant looking road pig. Spearhead also appeared in the main ARAH title with issue 80, which came out a couple months before Special Missions 21. However, this is unofficial. He was drawn on the cover on a rolling thunder along with Shockwave and Flint, but they had nothing to do with the story inside the book. So his first appearance is still considered Special Missions 21, and so his appearance on the cover means that somebody probably mixed up some reference sheets. Spearhead remained on the team though, deployed the off-panel, off-the-books missions, likely with the Night Force sub-team, until the Joes were stood down in 1994 with issue 155. During the Devil's Due era, when the team was reinstated, Spearhead was called back up to active duty to fight Serpentor, who'd taken control of Cobra Island. Spearhead and Max then appeared in IDW Publishing's A Real American Hero issue 214. This was the pit honor ceremony for Snake Eyes. And from there he went back to his off-the-books covert ops that were so secret they couldn't be told yet, so critical that he was still outside the wire in perpetuity, and so controversial the team needed plausible deniability. Either that or he was on assignment at another base. He was so busy that, as with others, Spearhead did not have time to make it into any of the animated series. His figure debuted after the Sunbow animated series wound down and ended, and the only place that Spearhead is animated is for G.I. Joe's TV commercials. And there, someone actually drew a chin strap on him, which is a departure from his strapless, strangely fitting K-Pot helmet on his figure. Speaking of figures, Spearhead's first action figure was the tan and rather orange Point Man who debuted in 1988. This figure showed up in the photos in the Operation Deep Six mail-away offer. He was driving a bomb disposal unit, catching mines that Cobra was dropping offshore from a Cobra night landing raft. However, this was an ad for the vehicle. So, as noted below the photo, the figures were not included. Estrella's Commandos Amasau figure was called Bayonetta. This means bayonet, the bladed point, as is his role, the tip of the spear, the point of the bayonet. Of note on this file card is that Max is referred to as a lynx and not a bobcat. I mean, bobcat is a lynx, but the verbiage change is worth noting. The 1989 Night Force version of Spearhead was part of a two-pack Toys R Us exclusive set, and this pack came with Muskrat. In 2013, Spearhead and Max appeared in the Nocturnal Fire set that was exclusively available at JoeCon that year. That same convention released a G.I. Joe vs. Cobra comic book via fun publications that also happened to include Spearhead. And finally, 2015 gave us the last version of Spearhead, and this figure was released in Volume 3 of the G.I. Joe Collectors Club figure subscription service. Now back once more to his tan and orange fatigues after some feedback from the fandom. In addition to his machete, fictional weapon, and his M4, he also got an M60 here which made his ammo belt make more sense. And this rather orange Max was a loud repaint of the Nocturnal Fire version from two years prior. His quote here is, Once Max gets the bad guy sent, I'll have them lined up in my sights. And with that quote, that's a wrap on this one my friends. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe, and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this each and every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.